Welcome to the Retire Sooner podcast. Today with me, Carol Robin, PhD, and the co-author of Connect, Building Exceptional Relationships with Family, Friends, and Colleagues. She is, so for so many years, I want to say, let's call it two decades, at Stanford University, the graduate school, teaching a course in interpersonal dynamics. And I, I don't know, Carol, I'll ask you if, you, if you gave it this name or it was na- it ultimately was called uh, AKA touchy, the touchy feely course. Yeah. And you are like the queen of the touchy feely course. And <laughs> I just wanted to see did, where did that, did, did you come up with that? Or did the students oh. say we love this so much and oh, they, yeah. they name it for you? No, no. The, yeah. The course is called interpersonal dynamics. Uh, and of course it's taught at the graduate school of business, uh, where students expect to arrive and learn all about finance and accounting and strategy and marketing. Uh, and then they land in this, uh, it's an elective. It's always been an elective. It was the most popular and sought after elective oversubscribed every year for many decades uh, because students found it life-changing, transformational, and not only with regard to helping them become better leaders, but become better human beings. So, uh, and the premise of the course is that being interpersonally competent is what helps you both professionally and personally succeed. But but you did this in the context at Stanford in the business school. So in you, the business school. Yes. So you were you were early on uh, you were you were corporate in Fortune 500. So maybe let's just start there. So you were corporate and then where did how did this start to evolve? Uh, it, the course started 45 years ago with my co-author uh, who was kind of, if I'm the queen of touchy feely, he's the father of touchy feely. Okay. And, uh, and it was with 12 students. It was like a little pilot. Then along came 25 years ago, along came Daniel Goldman and his research on emotional intelligence. Yeah. And then suddenly people discovered America and thought, oh gosh, maybe actually people do business with people. Maybe we should pay attention to that. So then the course started to grow more and more in popularity when I joined it. Uh, the the business school, because I've had six different careers. I'm not a career academic. But when I first joined the business school, we uh, they were teaching four sections of 36 students. By the time I left in 2017 to start my nonprofit, that we were teaching 14 sections of 36 students. But the, so the genesis, though, when let's say you're 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 at your corporation. Yeah. And then the you basically said, let's go do a pilot program, or were you already say, I, I want to go be a professor is my next career? Oh, yeah, no, no. So the the genesis of the course precedes me. It all started with my co-author, David Bradford. Mm-hmm. What happened was that as it started to gain popularity, because what students discovered is what I said earlier, they were learning not just about how to be better managers and leaders, they were learning about how to be better husbands and better daughters and better sisters and uh, that they, that it grew more and more in popularity. And so I was brought on 20 years ago, but 21 years ago, uh, and it had already been around for a while. But what ha- and so what happened was somebody, t- you know, early on said, well, somewhere in this organization behavior area, we should have a course about this. And it was very, it started very small and it was, uh, I, I don't want to say controversial, but it was hard for our colleagues to believe that it was based on social science, even though it was. <laughs> uh, so they always wondered why we were teaching this course at a at the graduate school of business at Stanford. It should be like a training right, course. yeah, right. So, so and, and then how much has that evolved since when you so twenty, you know, David. Bradford had started this, he's your co-author, and then you came in 20 years ago and, and yeah. subsequently been MBA Distinguished Teaching Awards. You're obviously extremely good at teaching this. Yes. How much has it evolved and where is it today? Obviously, it's in your book, Connect, but give yeah. us maybe an overview of where you are today. I think today there is wide acceptance that yeah. this is, we, we're all in the people business. Yes. And maybe 20 years ago, when Six Sigma was the thing, it was like, Exactly. Not, it wasn't quite like that 20 exactly. years ago. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So where and are it, we today? Well, I do think that there's a flywheel that got that has got that got started and is continuing now in appreciating 
the, the soft skills, which are turn out to be the hardest. You know, years ago, I did a, a gig at NASA with a bunch of, you know, executives at NASA, and I was teaching this stuff. And, the, and at one point, I said, come on, guys, because of course, they were all guys. This isn't that hard. And they said, oh, no, Carol. I said, no, I said, this is not rocket science. And they said, oh, no, Carol, it's so much harder than rocket science. Is, so I, I totally believe that. That's awesome. So, yes, I think a flywheel has gotten started. And of course, what's happened now, by the time we have this many thousands of students over this many decades who are out in the world talking about what they learned and living what they learned, there are more and more people saying, how do I get me some of that? Yeah. And they, they've been after us for years to write this book. We kept saying, nah. We were approached for years. We kept saying, nah. Then the Penguin Random House editor who finally got us said, so let's see, you've got this class that has been life-changing, transformational for thousands of students for decades. And the only people who get to learn that are the people who are privileged enough and lucky enough to get in the Stanford Graduate School of Business. How is that okay with you? Then that's, that's when David and I looked at each other and said, I guess we're going to write a book. But then it took four about but then it took four years to get it to, to get it completed. To get right? it to where we thought we were do justice to yeah. the course. It takes forever, doesn't it? It takes so long. It depends on the job you want to do. You know, one of the things that you could do it pretty quickly if you're if you're not a compulsive perfectionist uh, like me, uh, I suspect. But I also think that we were very clear that A, we didn't want to write three easy steps to better relationships. That's mm -hmm. not what we are. B, we didn't want to write an academic book because we actually wanted it to be out in the world and have and be true to what the, our editor talked us into writing, something mm -hmm. that would be accessible to lots and lots of people. Uh, so uh, we had to find a way to write it in a way that would do justice to it. And I actually think it's, it's as close as we're going to get to touchy-feely one chapter at a time. So the and again in in my new book that 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 about happy retirees my second book about happy retirees I have an entire chapter about social connectedness and yeah. I I talk about the research that I've done on that but I'm interested in your research on this and maybe we start with where do we so let's say in 2021 we know that the interpersonal relationship skills are essential now yes. to, to business. I love the, the, the life side of this too, but where do we maybe get, what do we still get wrong about it? And let's start there. What are the biggest mistakes that we are, that we don't see? Well, interestingly, they're the same, whether we're talking about in business, the, the reason the title is connect building exceptional relationships with family, friends, and colleagues is that when we make the mistakes we make, we make them in all three places. Mm. So there's a fault, you know, one of the things to remember is that the, the fundamental core principles of building strong relationships apply regardless of the context. So the first one is you have, and, and by the way, relationships exist on a continuum. At one end of the continuum is you can almost not call it a relationship, it's contact, no mm -hmm. connection. At the other end is something that feels rewarding and enriching and, and, and meaningful. Uh, and that's what we would call connection in a relationship. So there are ways to move your relationships along that continuum. You don't necessarily want to take every single relationship all the way to exceptional, but there are lots of ways to at least take your relationships to robust or functional even, <laughs> whether it's in business or at home or with your friends or with your church group. Uh, so I think that's the, so this, coming back to your question, what are some of the mistakes people make? I've got a number of different tools uh, that to think about. And then the book is full of this. I mean, the book is very practical. And by the way, at the end of every chapter, there's a section called Deepen Your Learning where you're encouraged to go do something with what you just learned because you're not going to learn how to be more interpersonally effective by reading about it. You're going to actually have, have some exercises. with yeah. some, um, And on our website, we you can download a build your own learning group for free. There's all kinds of stuff that we can help you with. But let's go back to some of the mistakes we make. The first, one of the mistakes we make, and this happens 
in business a lot, but I also think it happens as people age and we get very stuck in the image we have of ourselves and mm. how we have to portray ourselves. So the business version of this is a CEO who always has to present himself as crushing it, mm -hmm. even though they're not. And, uh, and what that does is it creates distance with other people because nobody is always crushing it. Right. So one of the hallmarks of, a, of an exceptional relationship and even a relationship that's moving towards exceptional is a willingness to allow yourself to be more fully known. Mm. So, tra it's a, so a lot of this is transparent. Well, that is transparency to some extent. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and vulnerability. It's, it's a vulnerable, that's right. And the reason people don't allow themselves to be more known is because it feels vulnerable. It feels risky. If I show you this part of me, then you may not like me as much, or you may not think as much of me. The, the, the thing that is unequivocal in our experience for decades is that the more of me I show you, the more you're going to like me. Now, Even if the part that I show you is a part that I'm not so proud of. Now with you though, so, okay, but what, so what you discovered though, in this course, in this book is that I tend to think that that is very different, or at least our, our, we're, we're raised yes. to think that we are vulnerable to this population, yes. maybe family. I can talk to my mom about this, yes. but I'm totally not vulnerable to my employees and my colleagues yes. because I have to be like the tough leader but maybe friends, like some friends I'm open with and some I'm not. So you're saying that it's, it, we should really look at every relationship with a similar level of all these different things, vulnerability being one. Right. And in fact, one way to think about it is instead of a switch, think of it as a knob. At one end of the knob, I don't share anything. At the other end of the knob, I share everything. And, and then, you know, and in the book, we have a little tool called the 15% rule. Let's say you're wanting to become a little better known by somebody because you want to move towards a deeper relationship. Yeah. So yeah. You're, you're going to start by being a little vulnerable. You're gonna disclose something that, you, that, they don't, that you've never told them. The 15% the rule is this. Imagine three concentric circles. The circle in the middle is your comfort zone. You don't think twice about saying that. The circle at the very, uh, outside is your danger zone. In a million years, you'd never consider saying that. Yeah. And in the middle is what we call our learning zone. By the way, same principle applies if you if you ski. You know, they don't take you to the black diamond slope to learn, but they don't leave you on the bunny slope. Yeah. So we used to tell our students, you've got to stretch outside your comfort zone and take a little risk in sharing. But they used to say, but the minute I'm outside my comfort zone, how do I know I'm not... In my danger zone. Yeah. And we say, try 15%, just a little bit. So, for example, if I wanted to push myself 15% outside my comfort zone right here with you, I would tell you that I'm a brand new grandma. That doesn't feel very risky. Uh, and then I would add that my, my husband and my son are both incredibly grateful that I also just launched a book because it means that I can spread my obsessive neurotic compulsion <laughs> across two things I really care about. Yeah, okay. So you maybe went to 25%, but I like that because the, the you're just saying dial up what your cup now you're just dialing up sharing in your vulnerability a little bit here exactly and for me that was 15 okay. percent for someone else that might feel way outside their comfort zone so you've got it you know everybody's different every situation is different but but note i made an intentional choice because i want you to know me a little bit better mm -hmm. and, but as an example though the the danger zone so we've got comfort then learning then danger the danger as an example, something maybe like, let's say your deepest, darkest secret, uh, that is, that's when the knob is oh, totally turned up. Like that is really reserved for when you're really connecting with somebody like you correct that that's what uh, you mean no, by the danger zone a little bit. No, I'm not. So here's what happens. Once I step 15% on my outside my comfort zone and I have a good outcome, 
And then maybe you share something that's a little bit vulnerable for you, because mm -hmm. by the way, vulnerability and disclosure are reciprocal. Then maybe I'll share 15%. Then my comfort zone redraws. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go 15% beyond that. And the bigger my comfort zone gets, the closer we're going to get. I don't have to go all the way out to danger zone. That's not the definition of a, of a great relationship. And but what is the what would so what is the danger zone? There's a concept we talk about in the book called appropriate authenticity. So it's important to to think about the context because the danger zone may look very different in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm the VP of marketing. Actually, I've used this example a lot. Uh, but it's a good example. Let's say I'm the VP of marketing and we've lost market share for three months. And I don't know what the heck's going on. One version of disclosure is to stand in front of the troops and say, well, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do about it. I probably shouldn't be your VP of marketing. Well, that would be disclosing. And that would be in that context, a danger zone. Yeah. Okay. And inappropriate authenticity. But hmm. there's a version of it that's maybe fit, maybe in the learning zone, which is, you know, gang, that's the third month we've lost market share. I'm, I'm really disappointed and I'm worried. I'm not exactly sure I know what to do about it, but I've never needed all of you more to help me figure it out. That's appropriate authenticity and a little vulnerable. Yeah. Okay. That makes total sense now. So the, the danger zone is when you are leaving, you really, you have a, a level of vulnerability out of context with your role. Exactly. Uh, perhaps I could, I could go home and tell my husband that's the third yeah. month in a row we lost market yeah. share and I feel like and crap. Saying, hey, but that's shit, I don't know what's going on, but you wouldn't say that to your team today. Got that. Okay. <laughs> makes total sense. I, I, I'd love for you to share with us the continuum as a little bit more context. Yeah. And I love visually the content, the, this continuum, uh, your continuum of let's say limited connection, robust connection, exceptional connection. Yeah. You walk me through that a little bit. Walk our listeners through that just a little bit. So as you start to move down this continuum, you not only am I comfortable sharing more about myself with you, but I make it easier for you to share a little bit more with me. And one way I do that is by initiating disclosure. But another way I do that is by engaging in what we call inquiry. The root of the word inquiry is quest. I don't know what I'm gonna find. When I am really curious about you, the kinds of questions that I'm gonna ask you are very different than when I'm trying to already prove a hypothesis I have about you yeah. or, uh, or, or hide a, a piece of advice as a question. And advice, by the way, uh, is a pretty tricky double-edged sword. A lot of people think they build relationship by giving advice. Uh, I think advice can be very disempowering and it doesn't necessarily help you learn more about the other person. They come to you with a problem. You say, oh, well, here's what, and even if you say, here's what I would do, it's advice. Instead of getting curious, huh, when else have you experienced that? What have you already done? Where do you see that most manifest? Uh, you know, how have you thought about it so far? But we're so eager to get into showing somebody. And by the way, as we age, even more, I have so mm. much experience. I have so much I can teach you. We do this to our kids. We do this to our- Here's uh, what you do. Here's what you do. Here, here's what you do. And that that doesn't necessarily build connection. That's uh, it's so, it's so interesting that the advice, that, that line, which I, I think of, Hopefully I don't say that. I'm sure I do. Or I know, I know that as a line yes. for friends and family. Here's what you do. Yeah. That is a is literally that is moving backwards on the continuum very often. Yes. What a great yes. by the way, what a great disclosure for our listener base in all of the and, and again, I know that you teach this, but what a good, what a great nugget to to remind. I'm I think most of us would think that's not how we do it, but I know that's how so many people still are. Oh and, yeah, and, and I'll tell you what, I bet you do one other thing that's even more subtle, which is why questions. Questions that start with the word why. Why did you do that? That drives you right into justification and explanation. Why, why do you think that? 
Why, to the extent possible, try to turn any question into how, when, where. Stay away from the whys. Mm, why dangerous? The the direct, here's what you do advice dangerous, but how and... And where and when and what. Yeah. Are the powerful words that help the continuum. But, but, but let me Think go back to this difference. Why do you feel that way? It's a little judgy. Well, what's the source of that feeling? Mm -hmm. Just 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 think about what it does to you viscerally when you hear those. Where is that coming from versus yes, why do you exactly. feel that way? Exactly. And and I do you have a so the the but let's go back to the continuum for just a second. The um limited to exceptional yes uh where first of all do we have a do you want to maybe just talk us through that just a little bit more and then how much room here's a question i don't know at all i've done actually some, some studies on this and i have some theory but how many people on this on different spots of the continuum can we have i mean clearly on the limited side the acquaintance side let's say maybe you can have 100 oh, yeah. people yeah. but on the exceptional side and then robust, do you have room for five robust and three exceptional, you know, right? It, when, when is it like the human maximum in a world well, of yeah. 5,000 friends on Facebook? No, no, that's interesting. That's a great question. So I don't think you can have more than maybe a handful of exceptional relationships. Yeah. They take, they take a lot of work. They're, they're intense. They, uh, they take a lot of maintenance, uh, but I do believe that you can have many more relationships in the robust, in the middle category than most of us have. Mm. And I, and what I absolutely know unequivocally is that you can move any relationship. You Well, of course it takes two to tango, but that there's a possibility to move any relationship that you want to invest more in along the continuum. For so especially, go yep. no, go ahead. Yeah, for example, the, maybe let's just uh, give a, a, an overview for our listeners of what, how you in the book and in, in yeah. connect, how do you define robust? What's that, what's that look like for you? Well, the book takes five different dyads, a father and a daughter, a married couple, uh, two colleagues who work together, two buddies uh, guys who hang out together and two girlfriends that have been longtime friends. Uh, I don't know if that was five, but for example, and what we do in the book is we take you through the arc of their relationship as a way of demonstrating how you move along and what it looks like at these different junctures. And some of them get to exceptional and some of them don't, but they all get to robust. Mm. In fact, we use an analogy in the book of climbing a mountain and uh, of hiking and getting to an upper meadow, which is where it's where 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 your where your relationship is functional and robust. It's been some work. It's better. It's certainly stronger than it was when you were down at the foothills and you've climbed together and you've been through a few uh, bumps along the road, but you get to the upper meadow and by the way, the big peak, it looms ahead. It can be stormy. It can be, it's a much more difficult climb. You might be perfectly content staying at the meadow and you can stay at the meadow with many more people. So the getting to robust is a, is a wonderful place to be from a connection standpoint, a close yes. connection standpoint. It still really is a, our close connections. And absolutely. You can't get to exceptional unless you get to robust. Yeah. The and the it's those dyads in the book that you talk that you walk people through, and not everybody gets there. Yeah. But whether you're a, whether you're a, a, you and your girlfriends, or you and your buddies, or a husband and wife, you're you're providing that path, Carol, to really uh, I guess pretty much anybody that picks up connect gets to see right an example of how they move along the continuum exactly for your population in particular it, there's the there's a story of phil and rachel a father and a daughter which is a, a a pretty compelling story and by the way all these stories are amalgamations of people that we actually have known mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and it, and you know i just got the sweetest 
email from a former student who said, hey, my dad picked up Connect because I've talked about the course for years. And he was like, oh, I finally get to learn what she, what she learned. And he just wrote to me and said, wow, I can't wait to put the lessons in this course to work on updating some of my old patterns and being a little more vulnerable and building a stronger relationship with you. She said, I burst out crying. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I finished the, the, my first draft of, uh, uh, the, uh, of my latest book, the, what, what, the happy re, what the Happiest Retirees Know. Yes. Uh, before, really before, a bit, well, I think timeline-wise, around, around the same time you published, so I, I didn't, it, I underlapped yes. uh, in the, in the social chapter, your book connect, but because I still have a couple months left on rewrites, uh, perhaps some of connect gets mentioned inside of that chapter as a, as a kind of another resource for yeah. happy retirees to take their relationships to another level. And I think that, you know, listen, it's hard. One of the, one of the tough jobs here, and I'll let you weigh in on this. When you leave, if you think about the retire sooner culture, whether you're 50 and you're a really early retiree or, or all the way in, in your 60s, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Whenever you leave the your social epicenter is how what I refer to as this. And, and for work, yeah. so many people um, work is yeah. your social epicenter. Yeah. And it then creates it's this it's this uh, it, it's the catalyst for other socialization. And that's why for men and women, and it's a little worse for men in the research it's so difficult after you leave work to maintain the same social connectedness because your, your, your epicenter is gone. Right. Um, I, I think I would ask you, do you see it at different ages? Is it harder for some, it's gotta be harder for the, for a, a population that is not working. Carol, would you agree with that? Or do you think it's the same for anybody uh, along the age spectrum? Well, in order to move along this continuum, you have to have a growth mindset. And what I'm, and if you've read Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset, uh, it's it's about it's about changing your language from saying I can't to I can't yet, or I don't know how to I don't know how yet. The word yet critical in 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 shifting your mindset. The other thing I think that happens when we spend our so much of our life at work, to your point, that's our epicenter for some kind of social connection. A lot of it is based on task. A lot of, of it is based on what we all do together. Mm -hmm. And so, and the identity that I have there and how I relate to people there and the way they relate to me. That doesn't mean that you can't have that same kind of relationships with people outside of work, uh, with your spouse at home, with your kids, with your good friends, with your men's group. My, my former student also said that, she, that her dad was taking the book to his men's group and they were all going to read it together, which I thought was pretty cute. So the, the idea here is that sometimes I think work contexts leave us thinking we're more connected than we really are. Do mm -hmm. people at work really know you? Mm -hmm. Do they really do? Do they do you really trust them? Do 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 you really know them? Uh, do you deal with conflict productively, or do you just avoid it? By the way, one of the things that happens as you move along the continuum, you get better at dealing with conflict productively. It's not that you don't have conflict. It's in fact that conflict ends up building the relationship, creating an even stronger relationship. And you would you say that you can't even have you can't it's you can't even get to the the right of the continuum without it. I there's think no, that's there's really right. no there's no clean sailing to exceptional. This doesn't happen. No, I mean it's easier in some cases. Yeah. Uh, than others. Uh, David and I had the last chapter in our book is a is is a chapter of a huge fight that he and I had. I said I would never talk to him again, <laughs> and I mean it was that bad. It was huge, and we had a what we both considered an exceptional relationship already. And then he did something I just thought was unforgivable, and I said I'd never talk to him again. And the last chapter is the story of how we came back from that. 
using everything we talk about in the book and how in the end, we would have never written a book together if we hadn't been through that because our relationship was even stronger after it. The, uh, so, so as an example, the let's, let's maybe take an example of how we use this in, in maybe for a spouse or, and you had mentioned Phil and Rachel, who's the, who's the father daughter uh, duo in this book, but maybe an example of, of taking somebody a notch up or maybe it's siblings that are, um, I feel like so many families, it, no, no, very few families I know that they all get along and they're all perfect yeah. buddies and friends. And it, it's almost always they've got, oh, we don't ever talk and maybe a repair strategy for some of that. And then of course we just all live through this crazy you know, yes. year of COVID and, 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 and less opportunity to connect. Yeah. There's a lot of questions there, Carol. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which, well, make me, me make us better at everything. Uh, okay. Well, first, first buy the book, then buy it for everybody, you know, then read it together and then work through it together. There you okay. go. Now, having done that, because by the way, I did spend my first 10 years in sales and marketing. So you can take the girl out of sales, but you can never take the sales out of the girl. Uh, but let's come back to your question. So if you want to move your relationship along, let's say one of the, one of the really core principles in the course and in the book is addressing what we call pinches, you know, in any relationship, people will do something that is mildly annoying, at least sometimes. Yeah. Just you, right? Always. Come on. Always. always yeah. Always. Yeah. Right. So our tendency is to say, eh, I'm just going to let it go. Or to say, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. Or it would all, and by the way, I'm not saying every pinch should be addressed. But one of the things we talk about in order to move along this continuum you have two antenna that you don't realize you have. One is an internal antenna that picks up signals on your emotional state. By the way, you keep you hear me keep coming back to feelings. That's why they call it touchy feely, because of the emphasis on the feelings. So you have an internal antenna picking up your feelings, and hopefully you have an external antenna that's maybe picking up some signals on what's going on for the other person. When it comes to a pinch you need to listen to your own emotional cue to figure out whether you should say something. Because if it's a no big deal and it passes, then, then no. But if it continues, if I'm doing something that bugs you a little and, I, and you don't say anything, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And every time I do it, it bugs you a little more. And then pretty soon it turns into a crunch. And then it's so much harder to deal with. So, one way to think about just a, a very low risk way of moving up the continuum is to address pinches. What oh. a, by the way, I love that terminology. It's so, it's such a nice way to say you're annoying the shit out of me <laughs> is saying, um, Hey honey, this is a, I would say maybe not with Lynn or my wife, but even like a buddy of mine, maybe, it's a little bit of a, that's a pinch. Actually, I wouldn't say that to, a, I wouldn't be vulnerable enough to say to a buddy, hey, you're pinching me. Me, but what a wonderful, hey, my brother, yeah. one of my brothers, he listened, that is, you're, you're pinching me right now. And I'm just going to address it because it's not that bad, but it's a pinch. It's yes. a, such a, it's just, I love the terminology of that. Yes. And by the way, if you include, I want to address it before it gets bigger. Crunchy. I'm afraid that if I don't, it'll get bigger. We're both better off yeah. if you know, so that then you have a choice whether to continue that behavior or not. The, okay. So we, we, the pinch brings it up and then we can solve that together. And which by the way, it moves us along the continuum exactly to better relationship, more connected. The, so the, you know, I deal with, and I think that the folks that listen to this podcast are very interested in getting to financial security. Yes. as quickly as possible. That's yes. retire sooner. Yes. And then, and so the younger folks, even the baby boomers are, are, are dealing with their parents who have yeah. been retired maybe a really long period of time. And you got, you have this real, what I think is a, this, this great struggle. Maybe it's the, it's another big phase in life when you go from parent to child and child to parent and the relationship flip-flops Yes. to, uh, I'm to caretaker from mm -hmm. being taken care of. Mm -hmm. And what are 
What are some of your suggestions for that? Really, that's a tough stage. It's a very tough stage. I think that one of the biggest challenges as we age and our, uh, our relationships change, they have to be in some ways redefined. It's, it's almost like the, the dynamics and the rules of the, of the relationship when my kids were teenagers have had to change significantly as they became adults. Same thing with me and my, my now deceased parents as they aged. And the first thing that you have to do is acknowledge that we have to change the relationship because we are different people. We have both grown. And therefore, we have to, in some cases, renegotiate. And that's the Phil and Rachel chapter in the book is all about that. Uh, they've, they've interacted in a particular way, which worked great when she was younger. It doesn't work as well now that she's, a, you know, an adult grown woman. Same thing with the married couple, Maddie and Adam in the book, who got married, had a, a certain set of, they, they'd made a deal that she would stay home. And then she decides she wants to go back to work. Uh, and, you know, she's at a different stage. And now he wants to hold her to their old deal. Mm -hmm. So the, the capacity to learn how to talk about those things in ways that invest in each other's learning and growth and in your relationship is it's not easy, but boy, on the other side of it is a much richer, more rewarding relationship. You know, I see that even in both ways. In, in I, and I know that these are the Maddie and Adam and, yeah. uh, and, you're, and, and Rachel and Phil are, are amalgamations of, of multiple people and relationships that have all happened, but you're right. I mean, I, I think of the, from a retirement planning perspective, I, I've seen the arguments of, oh, wait, you said you weren't going to work and now you want to work to, hey, we said you weren't going to work, but now I want you to work. Yes. And, and I've seen it, yeah. you know, both are tough. Absolutely. And and I've seen people sc scour at each other in, in yes. front of me in planning meetings. And you, clearly they have been having a really issue, a real issue that is totally unsolved with that. And, and, what that's a, and you know what? that's a wonderful opportunity for them to get closer if they can enter into it with curiosity. If, 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 if I told my husband, I, you know, yeah, I said it was okay for you to retire, but I actually want you to earn more money. Yeah. For, and, and for him to get curious and say, huh, what happened? What's different for you now? What, when did that become important? What, how are you looking at it then versus how you're looking at it now? Then he's going to learn a lot more about me. I'll give you a really quick, simple example. After our grandson was born, my husband says to me at one point, he, you know, he's been counting the days for years when he was going to finally become a grandfather. So he says to me, so what will you do if Nick and Alex don't, don't want us to, you know, ever take care of the, you know, of Sam and, you know, they don't really want us that involved in Sam's life. No, he said, how will you feel? He didn't say, what will you do? He said, how will you feel? And I said, oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd understand it. My, my mother was a busybody. I didn't want her involved in my business when I had kids. And he said, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, how will you feel? Hmm. And I said, because of course, he's lived with me for 35 years. He's learned all about how he knows the tactics. conversations yeah. are deeper. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll feel disappointed and sad. Hmm. And that, that was, was a far more connecting moment than I'll totally understand because my mom was such a busybody, which he already knows. It dramatically different answers. And I think it's, were conditioned, you know, to default to the first one of what you had just said. So even though you teach this and you're like teacher of the year of this, distinguished yes. professor of the world in this, even you slip into that. Absolutely. Yeah. There is one thing though, that I, that I'm very good at and that I would really urge all of your listeners to get good at, which is it is grammatically impossible to express a feeling 
if you start a sentence with I feel that or I feel like, because uh, try putting a feeling word after that. I feel that sad. I feel that angry. I feel like hurt. Impossible, which is why there is a vocabulary of feelings in the book and why we give it to our students as part of their syllabus, because to your point, we don't know how to express feelings. We don't. And so we say, so I give, give, give us, give us care. one, voc give us, give us a vocab teaser for the book. Instead of, I feel that, what do I want to, I want to train myself or my spouse or my close relationships. What do I want to, what do I want to say here? What's the vocab I want? So honey, when I speak to you and you make no eye contact and the only thing I get back from you is a grunt. This is, by the way, this is Lynn, by the way, this is Lynn saying that to me, by the way. And, right. th and that, by the way, is being behaviorally specific. I don't feel heard. Or I feel dismissed or I feel unimportant or I feel hurt instead of I feel that you don't care. I don't know whether you care or not. It and really is. So the vocab, you basically take out that. Yes. And you just say, because you can't dispute how you feel. Exactly. So I feel, insert feeling word, which is why you need the vocabulary, because like you start to say, I feel that. And then you realize, oh, wait, I'm supposed to drop the that, or I'm supposed to drop the like. And now it's, I don't know what I feel. Oh, I think I'll pull it. I mean, these students walk around all quarter, literally with their vocab of feelings in front of them until they learn. You know, it's like a language. It doesn't happen overnight. It's it's practice to do this because, I mean, you can read the book and you can take the class, but it does take time to rethink and readdress how you are approaching this in relationships and connections. Yeah, it's it's a discipline. Now, the the feeling, the the construct of I feel insert feelings is part of a larger, perhaps too complicated to describe in just a couple of minutes model that's core to the course and the book, which is the concept that we call the net. Uh, and, and for 30 seconds, the idea is that in any interaction between two of us, there are actually three realities. There's mm, my yeah. intent and what I do, there's the, my behavior and there's how it lands on you. And the only reality known to the two of us is the behavior. But the net, the idea of the net is that there's this metaphorical net between my intent and my behavior, or in the case of my husband, his intent and his behavior. So when he grunts and makes no eye contact, and I say, you, I don't, you know, I feel that you don't care. I'm over the net. I don't know whether he cares or not, because I don't know what his intent is. I don't know what's going on for him. So, because you're placing onto him what you think he feels. Exactly. And by the way, I don't even know what he feels. The let's talk a little bit about the and I know I'd already mentioned a little about career or loss. How do we deal? And I think about when when again, maybe it's a little worse for men, but it's tough for both uh, husband yeah. and wife. When you when you leave a career, it's almost like a little bit of a it can be a loss. It's a feeling of yes. loss. It's definitely. The and then, then anytime we have a loss, then there's this this other this other issue or question of support, where we haven't talked about that yet. We've talked about vulnerability, we've talked about conflict and how we get better through it. But I, I guess then I get maybe, maybe though, Carol, uh, support is a version of of vulnerability, but it's actually a little beyond. I, I you know, and I may be I, I'm thinking of situations or examples. I, you know, I'm okay. We have a really uh, culture of uh, maybe great vulnerability here at our firm. Mm -hmm. We were a tiny, tiny firm many years ago, and now we're a much larger, we're uh, let's call a middle-sized firm, but we yeah. still have that same feel yeah. where we can be vulnerable. We've talked about these things, but support is actually a, even a different level in my, in my book, in my mind. Yeah. that whether a friend family it's like it's hard for me I'm, I'm more apt to be vulnerable and talk about my this is what i'm struggling with my issue but i it's another bridge to say here's what i i might even not i may not even know how i think somebody can help so very right. often i stop at vulnerability 
I'm like, I don't need support because I don't even know what to ask you to. I don't even know how you could help. Yeah, interesting because I was thinking that in order to ask for help, you have to be vulnerable in the first place. I, I don't know and I need help is a vulnerable statement to make. Uh, so in terms of how to, res how to respond to somebody who asks, so there's two different pieces to this, whether to ask, how to ask, and how to respond to somebody who's asked. So which, 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 which yeah, one? Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe let's first, at, because again, we've gone through a tough time in America. Yes. How do you, I would, I would say that, how do you ask if you do need some help? Um, and in my, my case or my example, uh, maybe I'm just projecting this onto others, but just saying, I don't, I don't know how I need, I don't know what you can even help me with. Like, how do we even know? Or, or is that the wrong question? Maybe it's not, I know what you, maybe you don't know what you need help with. And the question is just, I just need some help. I mean, what, what would you say to that? So the, the, I need help side, let's address that. So I would say, you know, I'm really struggling and I, I, and I have said this quite a bit, <laughs> I'm really struggling. I've written a book that I think could really change hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And I keep bumping it up against walls because I don't know how to get it out in the world in the way that I want to. I don't really know what to ask you for, but I feel closer just telling you. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the, that would be on the, on the asking end. Hold on, let me see if I can follow your advice here because I immediately want to tell you, I immediately want to say, yes, here's what you do. Yes. Oh, hold on. I'm so now you've got an opportunity to practice a little of what we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, so I would say, I totally get this, by the way, I, or at least I, I feel like I, I've had your same thought and struggle at some time in my life. And then I think I would ask you, uh, maybe where, where is that, where, where is that coming from? Where, where is that feeling coming from, Carol? Well, it's, it's tied to what I believe I was put on the planet to do. And my sense of uh, disappointment, if I don't do that. So it's, so is it a, um, I guess what you're saying is that there, there are different ways to think about it. You could say, I, I, I want to always wanted to be a best-selling author and I'm, you know, feel like a failure if it isn't, or is it, it seems to me that it's um, this more mission driven for you. Absolutely. And you don't really. If I was independently wealthy, mm -hmm. I would buy a book for every single educator in this country. I would buy a book for every person in Congress. I would buy a book for every CEO. I don't care about making money. I don't care about being on any lists. I don't care about being called bestseller. I just care about people learning and using this because I believe with every fiber of my being that if more people were armed with these skills and competencies, we would have better families, better communities, better, better organizations and teams, maybe even a better government. The so for you this. So is hang on before mission. it turns no. into a into a Carol West therapy session. Sort I'm of. Kind of like that though. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. <laughs> um, let's stop for a moment and just observe what's happened between us in this process. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about me right now? So I'm thinking uh, maybe I'm thinking about you more. Uh, fundamentally of like who you are fundamentally, as opposed to like you, you as a, a career person. Right. So you're yeah. seeing a fuller me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We just moved a little bit to the right. Exactly. The continue. Yeah, exactly. Now. Yeah, it does work. Yeah. The, the flip side of that, which is, you know, good call to not go immediately into advice. There's a concept that we talk about a lot in the course and in the book called feeling emotionally met. When somebody comes to you with a problem, whether they already have understand the problem or they're just struggling with even identifying it, the first thing they 
are likely to respond well to is feeling emotionally met. And what, what we mean by that is they feel heard, understood, seen, accepted. Like when you said, yeah, I, I, I get it. And I've been through that myself. That was part of helping me feel emotionally met. Okay. It's also not feeling judged. Like what's wrong with you, Carol? Of course, it's gonna be a bestseller. Of course, it's gonna get out there in the world. Not being dismissive. Because mm -hmm. if it makes you uncomfortable that I'm sad, that's one of the things that we tend to do. Oh, come on. No big deal. By the way, you already sold 15,000 books in the first three weeks. That's fantastic. Don't tell me that. That does mm -hmm. not address what I'm struggling with. Uh, another way to make somebody feel emotionally met is to be empathetic. And empathy is different than sympathy. Empathy is relating to the feeling. Oh, I know, I know the feeling of sadness. What you're describing might not have made, might not make me sad, but I can relate to the sadness mm -hmm. or I can relate to the anxiety or I can relate to the disappointment or anger or frustration. Uh, and yeah, by really, the way, you can do any of those things, if you don't suspend judgment, if you don't, if you don't suspend judgment, say that, explain that to our listeners. You can't do any of what I just talked about. You can't be curious. You can't be empathetic. You can't, uh, you, you can't, you can't, you can't do something that results in my feeling seen and understood if you, and accepted if you have judged me. So yeah. you have to suspend judgment. By the um, way, you want, you want one thing to move along the continuum? Yeah. Suspend judgment. Suspend judgment. It's hard to do for humans, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And by the way, once we've made a judgment, then we just look for confirming evidence that we're right. I'm right. I'm, I know. <laughs> the the uh, I'm not going to tell you what sibling this is, but I, I had a sibling say, I wish there was a Google recorder app so that every time I had an argument with my wife, I could go back and say, look, I sh this is what I said. And I was right. I was like, that that isn't that is an app that Carol Robin would she would, you know, that, that she would freak out. With that, well, I mean, that just makes on, relationships work. Before you go there, though, let me give you an example of of where actually having a replay. I mean, having a replay is not the right thing, but say, but paraphrasing is an important part of meeting someone emotionally too. Hmm. I walk into this. This is long ago. My husband had we had swapped jobs. He was staying home. He was learning how to cook. He's now a gourmet cook. He's fabulous. But at the time, he was learning how to cook. I would come in the kitchen, he'd be struggling. I'd say, honey, can I help you with that? And he would say, don't tell me what to do. Now, I would say, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I just offered to help you. And then we get into an argument. Instead, I started to, when, when he said, don't tell me what to do, I'd say, what did you hear me say? And he'd say, I, I heard you say I didn't know what I was doing. I, I heard that you say I was measuring what, that all wrong. Which yeah. is not what I had said. So we encode and decode. And one of the places to start when you're in the middle of, a, you know, when an argument's beginning is to stop and say, hang on, hang on. What did you just hear me say? Well, it's funny. The uh, I almost feel like cooking is underappreciated for just how <laughs> um, how difficult that is to navigate with two people. You know, oh, cooking yeah. is almost like boot camp for couples. So like, if you can get through uh, like a, a one week cooking session with your spouse or someone, I mean, it is, it is a serious uh, thing to be able to coexist with. But anyway, that's a whole nother a topic. No, for another but that's day. great because really my husband is like, if I need help, I'll ask for it and otherwise stay out of my kitchen. <laughs> what, an, what an amazing uh, recipe for connection. The last thing, because I've, I've literally, we've already, I've kept you for over an hour already. Let, let, let me go to last, uh, yeah. to last thing. The, uh, when it comes to satisfaction yes. and, uh, you know, I think uh, this is another thought when, when the retire sooner Again, another difficulty of not just leaving a social epicenter once you're done work, and maybe we've left work, maybe sense of purpose, and maybe one of the difficulties of financial independence really early 
is that you have, have had huge success and now your, your purpose is like, okay, I already did that. Yeah. Now I got to find a new purpose, a new satisfaction. Uh, and it's tough, right? You can yeah. always say, well, go find something new, but it's not that easy to just nail that. It doesn't happen overnight. And what is your advice on people that are struggling a little bit with finding that satisfaction or next purpose? Well, I would consider myself an expert on what you should do other than uh, the slice of relationship expertise that I have. I do know that one of, one of the holes to fill in your life is, is relationship uh, based because you had a lot of that at work and you don't have it anymore. Uh, I, also, uh, I also think that it's a wonderful time to, for learning and growth and repotting. My husband and I have lived in Palo Alto for 35 years. We're moving to the city, to San Francisco at the end of this month. It's a repot. Sometimes you just have to like, and you know what? Sometimes we think, boy, what are we now? We made a deal that we're swapping places with our son and he's gonna raise his kids in Palo Alto, et cetera. But, and sometimes I'm like, why are we doing this? All our friends are down here. Mm -hmm. Our whole social connection, all our social connections are down here. Our, our, our... And on the other hand, we're doing it because sometimes you have to repot in hmm. order to learn and grow. So here's the metaphor. You know how uh, when a lobster hatches, a, it, it builds a little, it, it grows a little shell. And it's, it's, it's pretty happy and it swims around. But unless it molts, it can't grow. So, but when it molts, it's kind of vulnerable. Yeah. Doesn't have a shell. So it goes and it finds a little crevice in a rock to hide under. So he's a little safer from predators and he grows, it grows, and then it comes back out. The shell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it goes out and swims around until it's time to molt again. So that's the metaphor. Yeah. You know, we're all works in process, we're all in, and in progress. We're all growing and learning. And one of the really great results of having more robust relationships in your life is that you learn from others and you learn about yourself in ways that maybe you never had. The, uh, and, and then I guess the last thought here is that this is from a relationship perspective, here's a tough thing that I encounter is when a spouse and another, the spouses are sitting there and one has a ton of, I actually, we call these core pursuits on yes. our, uh, yes. core pursuits yeah. in life and the other doesn't yeah. let's say and i hear this i've heard this many times yeah. honey you need to get some hobbies yes, <laughs> yes. that and I'm, I'm always thinking gosh what do i say yeah you of course you of course you do but i don't like that from a relationship standpoint to me that's a really judgy that's judgy oh, it's very judgy you need and to get I'm, some hobbies yes what I would mean, a bet what would be a better way for a spouse to say to another spouse or a partner, whatever. Yes. yes, uh, yes. What do we say instead? Well, I would start with, you know, honey, I've noticed that there are a lot of times when I'm busy doing stuff and you're not. And I wonder how that is for you. Are you, are you happy? Are you, I, I, I worry, but I don't know if I should worry. And I wonder if you'd like to talk about it. That's called curiosity and suspended judgment. Yeah, it is. Well, I'm going to try to- I would add, and I only want to have this conversation with you because I love you and I care about you. I love including you and I care about in, you. It, including your intent in saying whatever you say. I'm telling you this because if you raise a pinch, I'm telling you this because you remember when I talked about pinches, a lot of people think ah, it's not worth it. Substitute the word it for I, you, or we, I'm not worth it. You're not worth it. We're not worth it. And then ask yourself again, whether it's not worth raising. Because I love and care about you. Yeah. Because I love and care about you. So it comes from a, a, a really warm place. Yeah. which is a, is a great way to, to, to suspend judgment. Look, I, I just love you. And I just want to know right. how we can help how, right. how, how, when, where, Yeah, but not, 
here's what you need to do. You need right. to go and, get some And hobbies. by the way, maybe you don't want any help. Maybe you're perfectly happy mm-hmm. doing nothing. You need who to go to, to this, who am I to decide that you should go do something? You need to go take a cooking class because <laughs> you don't even know how to measure the, uh, right? Anyway, um, all right, Carol Robin, PhD author, co-author of Connect. And she, the, the cool thing about Carol here is that deep down, she actually does not care about how many books she sells. She cares about getting the message out. And when it is your obsession and your mission, then the latter and the success part of that equation usually plays out. And it's the, I think it's the missing the mission is where, um, and the passion and the obsession of that is where uh, the millions and millions of books that come out, not, not very few of them have that driving it and, and have that mission. And I, I think it's pre- very clear in a, in, a, in, a, in a very approachable and actually I would say touchy feely way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that Carol really, she, she cares deeply about this work that she's done for several decades. And she just wants to make it available to all of us out there. So um, I think, I, I hope, I hope people can learn from, yeah, learn here's from my it. hope. Here's my hope. In the same way that I get letters and emails and calls from former students decades later saying, I'm pretty sure what I learned from you just saved my marriage. I'm pretty sure that what I learned from you just helped me reconcile my relationship with my brother. In addition to, I'm pretty sure what I learned from you helped me get to be a CEO. I hope there are many readers who have that same experience. Carol Robin, thank you. Thank you, sir.